Hello guys, welcome back to the Value Hunt podcast. And today I'm so honored to be here with Alan. He's a Harvard professor and researcher, and I don't really even know how I'm speaking to him, but yeah, we are here and we are going to ask him a couple of questions today. Hopefully he will answer. And yeah, uh, let's have some fun. What do you think, Alan? I think that's, a, yeah, David, thank you so much for inviting me. I have no idea how we met. It's luck or destiny, you know, <laughs> as they say. But it's, you know, great talking to you. And hopefully you know, the audience is going to be happy with, with what, I, what, I, what I can say here. Yeah, for sure. It will be like a very different investing podcast. That's yep. for sure, because your background is amazing. And so, yeah, let's jump right into the first question, which is, who is Alan? Yeah, that, that's the guy you're talking to. That's the short answer. The slightly, <laughs> you know, the, the slightly longer answer is, so, so I'm, I'm originally from Croatia, a beautiful small country in Europe. So people who haven't heard or haven't visited it, you should definitely visit. And I, I was a physician there, a practicing physician there for a few years, uh, primarily in the field of precision medicine, which might be unfamiliar you know, to, to people, but kind of to explain it, precision medicine is, how I believe medicine should be practiced in a sense that you give the right patient the right drug at the right dose at the right time. And even though it may sound, well, duh, everybody does that. Well, how we did it in, in, in Croatia, this hospital, amazing hospital that I worked with in Zagreb, is we would basically do a small, simple mouth swab. So we would, a cheek swab, swab basically, and we would sequence the patient's genome. And then based on certain modifications or mutations in the genome and certain enzymes or receptors or transporters, anything like that, we would administer a specific drug at a specific dose. And that is called precision medicine because we're precisely you know, giving the right drug to the right patient based on their uh, genome. So it's, a, it's an amazing experience um, that I work with. And then uh, while, I was, while I was doing that, I was also, I'm, I'm still also part of an amazing group of people, uh, young physicians, young scientists from Croatia, where we organize um, international conferences in Croatia. And since uh, 2017, I'm proud to say that we've had over 2,300 participants at these biomedical conferences and 10 Nobel laureates. Um, last year was the 10th uh, Nobel laureate. So this year, we're going to have, I guess, the 11th or the 12th uh, Nobel laureate. And what we also do in this, in this organization that's called Medics, as in like doctors, medics, we also uh, partner with clinics or, or research labs from leading universities around the world, such as Harvard, MIT, um, uh, Columbia University, or Cleveland Clinic, these really reputable clinics to actually offer Croatian medical students an opportunity to do, to do internships there and gain really what I believe is invaluable experience, uh, both personal and professional, then go back to Croatia and actually uh, apply that in Croatia. So this is really a long-term investment. What we're what we're making here, and we we you know, we don't expect, as in I, I believe you know every long-term investor, you don't expect the results immediately after they go back home after a month or two at Cleveland Clinic. But once they you know get get the knowledge, get the experience, they start implementing changes in Croatia, and in ten years' time, hopefully, we'll see the fruits of of the work that that we did. And then in 2020, uh, during, the, during the pandemic, right, right before the pandemic in 2020, I actually moved to Harvard Medical School, which is you know, uh, uh, probably the surprise of my life, um, how that happened. I can tell you, you know, more about it um, later, and where I actually do sleep research, and I also worked in, in, a, in a sleep clinic in Croatia, um, you know, helping patients with, with sleep disorders and so on and so forth. And here, what we want to understand is how poor sleep quality or lack of sleep actually impacts health in the long term, actually. Um, so we, you know, we all know that after a day or two of poor sleep, you feel tired, not concentrated, lack of energy, all that stuff. But then 10 years down the road or 10, 20 years down the road of poor sleep quality, your health risk you know, for cardiovascular disorders, diabetes, all that nasty stuff actually goes up. So that's why you have to. Um, have to. I mean, it's advisable that, that you sleep regularly and you sleep between you know, seven to nine hours uh, for adults. And, and that's what I do here. I also, um, as you mentioned, kind of an intro, I also teach a class here at Harvard College, uh, amazing group of students. And it's really, uh, you would never kind of think coming from a relatively small town um, in Croatia called Split, a beautiful city, but relatively speaking, a small town kind of for European, I guess, world. Um, standards that you would, you know, go to Harvard and, and now you, you, you can say, oh, I actually taught a class at Harvard, which is, you know, pretty crazy, but that's what I do kind of here uh, for, for um, I've been doing this for like four years now. Yeah, almost four years now. So that's kind of the short 
story of 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 Alan. <laughs> yeah, that's the short story of your life, and like yeah. uh, I'm sure there's so many interesting details to it. And yeah. I love this question. I always say this in every single podcast because yeah. it always gives you like a different answer from the guest, and mm. everyone approaches it in a different way. And mm. uh, yeah, before jumping into like uh some questions about sleep because obviously yeah. you're the sleep expert uh, i would like to to know like how does one get to to like be a researcher a researcher in harvard and like be a professor yeah. in harvard especially yeah. coming from such a small town you know yeah it is uh it is almost, almost I'll, 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 I'll give more detail but it's almost like a movie story in a sense i mean it was it was actually televised in croatia and it was crazy you know um, kind of the story actually ends up you know croatian national television and stuff and it was amazing so the story goes as follows so as i mentioned the conferences that my team and i uh organize in croatia and we usually invite leaders in medicine nobel laureates and pretty you know high caliber people to network um with young scientists, young physicians, or kind of just young, young, ambitious medical students. And one of those professors that we invited uh, in 2019, just before the pandemic started, was a professor from Houston, from Texas. It's an amazing hospital. It's called MD Anderson Cancer Center. It's probably the best or one of the best cancer centers in the US, and probably in the world. And while I was driving him from the city of Split to the airport, which is like a 20 or 30 minute drive, um, it was only me and him in, in the car, and he told me that he was kind of pretty impressed with the conferences and everything, thought that I was a kind of an ambitious guy and whatnot, and he was like, why don't you come to Houston and see what we do in Houston? I would love you to, you to come for a month or so uh, just to observe our clinical practice for, to learn, basically, what, exactly what we want to offer students through the programs that I mentioned earlier, right, to Croatian students now. And I was like, what a cool opportunity, you know, driving him to the airport and getting, you know, offered a month in Houston. I was like, cool, let's do it. And then in September of 2019, the conference, is, the conference was in April, so like five months later, I actually visited Houston. And I did this amazing program, clinical observership, learned a lot. I mean, you know, when you go to these hospitals, you just, you cannot, you cannot not learn right, in, in these hospitals. It's an amazing experience. And then I had a week before I went back to Croatia. I was working in this uh, hospital, Precision Medicine, that I mentioned. I had a week off. And for whatever reason, and only in retrospect can you see that that moment changed your life, I thought to myself, well, you know, since, well, since I'm in the U.S. already, uh, why not visit the best universities in the world and see what they do? You know, I, I visited MD Anderson, amazing clinical center, but what does Harvard do? What does Stanford do? How does MIT look like? You know, you, you dream about these universities and you hear about them in movies, right? Harvard, everybody knows, you know, um, Harvard. MIT, Stanford. And, and what I did is I emailed one professor um, in the field of sleep from Stanford, Harvard, MIT, and then I actually ended up in Columbia as well in New York, uh, where this Nobel laureate actually invited me, but that, that's kind of a separate story. I emailed them and, I, and, and it was a two sentence email. Hey, I'm Alan, physician from Croatia. Super interested in learning what you guys do so I can actually gain some experience you know, in three hours because I had like seven days overall left in the US and go back to Croatia and, and, and kind of apply this in my local community hostel and whatnot. And to my surprise, everybody says, sure, just, just come to our lab and see what we do. So in, I think even less than seven days, I think it was probably six days, I, I flew from Houston to San Francisco to visit Stanford, then to Boston, then to New York, and then back to Houston and then to Croatia. So it was like a six month, six, six day I, um, tour. And I stayed in San Francisco for a day, maybe a day and a half, I forgot. In Boston, I think 24 hours. And then in New York, I think I stayed maybe two days. And then I went back to, to Houston. And kind of to, to summarize the, the most important part, when I came here to Harvard Medical School, where I, where I am now <laughs> currently, um, I got greeted by you know, this amazing professor um, of neurobiology, of neuroscience, basically she does sleep research. And she was like, come to my office. I want to talk about your past. What, what did you do you know, in life? Basically what we're talking about now, right? And then she also mentioned, look, we do this research at Harvard, that research. What do you think about this? Do you have any ideas? You know, what, what we should do, improve, change, whatever. And we, I talked to her for like two or three hours. And I, I'll never forget the moment that around two and a half hours into the conversation, so it's a pretty long conversation, but very chill, very casual, nothing formal, right? I remembered I had a bus that I needed to catch to go to New York, right? 
And the debate in my mind was, should I tell her I need to go to catch the bus or just kind of ignore the bus completely? And fortunately, I, I said to myself, I'm going to ignore the bus and catch another one. Even though for me, you know, paying $30 for a ticket back then was, you know, a, it was a meaningful amount because I didn't have a lot of money. I mean, not that I have a lot of money now, but I didn't have a lot of money. And I, I fortunately and thankfully, I said to myself, I'm, I'll ignore the bus. And then after talking to her, I visited the lab for like 15, 20 minutes, met people in the lab, came back to, to her office where she said, you know, the two sentences that changed my life. And those sentences were, hey, I was kind of impressed with this, this and that. And the second question was, hey, do you want to come and work with us um, and actually you know, be employed here? And I was like, you know, I didn't say to her, are you crazy? But I want to say, what do you mean, in, you know, work here? I came here as a tourist for like three hours and you're offering me a job at you know, the most prestigious med school in the world. And she was like, no, no, I really mean it. I want you to work with us. And I said, I need to think about this because this is, you know, you can't dream of, of coming to Harvard as a tourist and then exiting Harvard three hours later as an employee, basically. And I went back to Croatia. Um, I remember the bus from, New from Boston to New York that I, that I missed, but I caught another bus. I, I was, you know, in in on that bus, I was almost the feeling of, emptiness which is weird to say i had on that bus because you don't really know what's happened to you so you know you understand deep down that this is a moment that's going to change your life for forever basically uh, but you you can't comprehend that at that moment because you, you cannot imagine this happening and then a month or two later i texted her and said yeah let, let's do it and that's how i ended up at harvard so yeah, that's like a movie story for sure. Uh, and when you said like I was having a conversation like just like this yeah. one, I was thinking, oh, am I going to be invited to Harvard or something? Uh, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. But... <laughs> it's, it's, it's you, you cannot, you know, uh, at, at one moment during that conversation, I did think to myself, is this actually like an interview that I mean completely accidentally, right? But I, the second thought I had was, this cannot be happening, so I'm probably wrong. In the end, I was right. I mean, I was right. But in the end, that's kind of what happened, and I'm here now. So um, it's, it's, it's an interesting story, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, that's, that's for sure. Uh, and maybe like this is completely off of whatever I, I thought about asking you, but uh, yeah. you could like, uh, you seem like a person that attracts a lot of interesting people because like uh, these conferences that you make to to network, um, yeah, and so on. Like, uh, what's your um, I would say tips for someone that's that has nothing to offer, but yeah. still wants to uh, let's say exchange a couple of words with someone that can teach them a lot. So, uh, for example, yeah. a young person like me, how can I reach out to? A Harvard professor and like actually get like 15 minutes of his time to like chat or something, yeah. you know? Yeah, that's a great point. I, I I get asked that a few times on either you know podcasts or like lectures that I do, and 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 the first kind of thing that I would say is first of all we're all equal, right? You the fact that you're a student and I'm here doesn't mean anything to me, and I don't think it should mean anyone to to anyone anything in the sense that Jesus, that person is such at a high, such a high position, I can never be able to reach out. I mean, I understand that, that mentality, but the first thing that you should start with is think, can, can I actually uh, uh, have value by talking to that person? Not in the sense that that person is never going to be able to talk to me because they're so important and I'm just a student or whatever. And what I would just maybe modify what, what you said, I think every person has value to offer, right? In, in, in you know, different regards. It, the, the fact that maybe you're not, for example, yourself, maybe you're not super familiar with sleep neurobiology, whatever. But if you're super interested in that, reach out to me, reach out to somebody from heart, reach out to the best people in that field without thinking they're never going to reply to me, they're never going to do this and that. These people, so, you know, I had the fortune of meeting many Nobel laureates, more than 10, I don't know, 15 or whatever. And most of these people are just genuinely nice people who you never think that change the world of physics or medicine or whatever. Genuinely nice people who enjoy, and they really thoroughly enjoy talking to young people and teaching young people about whatever and sharing their incredible life experience with you. And, you know, people 
such as yourself. And that's why they come to our conference. They don't, they don't come because of me or whatever. They come because of the story that we offer, you know, 20 to 30 year old people, the opportunity to network with Nobel laureates to teach them something, right? To, but, but teach them not in the sense that I'm going to teach you the latest in sleep neurobiology, but to actually teach you and tell you about my career path, the challenges and the failures I face, because you're probably facing the same challenges. For example, when you finish college or, or medicine or whatever, what am I going to do in life? You know, don't, many people have those thoughts, like what's the next step? And when you hear from Nobel laureates, the dean of Harvard Medical School who was there, extremely impressive person, when they tell you, I had no idea what I was going to do after I finished Harvard or whatever. That tells you something. These people had the same kind of concerns that you, you know, not, not specifically maybe yourself, but young people um, have. And it's amazing. They reaching out to them, talking about their careers or whatever their professional path is. And these people really value proactive people. So not that they need to, you know, push you and whatever. If you're the one that's going to be proactive, reach out to them. Send an email. And it's another email reminder because don't, don't forget, these people you know, receive hundreds of emails per day from numerous you know, people. So don't be discouraged if somebody doesn't reply to you. Maybe they just didn't see it. I mean, I miss emails as well, and I'm much less in the hierarchy you know, compared, to, compared to them. So proactive, just tell your honest story, why you want to talk to them, why you want to meet them, why do you find value in talking to them for whatever reason, and just based on my experience, they'll reach out to you. They'll meet you. If you're in the same city, they'll meet you. So just be proactive. Just be. But you have to have the proactive mindset, I would say, as well, that you develop and learn. I don't think people are maybe born with that, but maybe certain you know, childhood experiences or adolescent experiences kind of shape you in that way that you, you become a proactive, proactive person. That's my, you know, my top tip for every student at Harvard or whoever you know, talks to me. And you know, people reach out, which is great. I really love and enjoy you know, giving advice is helping as much as I can. Obviously, my advice is not dogma. I just, you know, it, it's based on my life experience, which might be completely different. And one last thing, completely different to somebody else's, right? And one last thing I'll say is, having talked to these, you know, amazing people, so we had by the chief medical officer of Microsoft, who's now the, you know, the person responsible for AI in Microsoft, he's an ama extremely intelligent person, amazingly impressive person, had the you know, opportunity to meet him. He was here at Harvard. So having talked to you know people like him, like you know Dean's Nobel laureate, every almost every almost no career path is the same. So they end they may end up at the same let's say position in a sense. Professor at Harvard, Nobel laureate, chief medical officer of an incredibly important company, but their life paths are so different, so different. Yet they end up at the same level. So so you, whatever I tell you or somebody else tells you. The, 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 as long as you have the destination in mind, you'll find the pathway to there. So you need to have a destination because there's a great saying, and I, I, I don't know if I can really literally translate it. I, I think it's maybe a Croatian saying, uh, or I don't know where I heard it, but if you, don't, if you don't know the destination, you won't be able to set the sails in the right direction so that the wind can take you to that you know, destination. So find the destination, find the goal, and it, and and I'll, I'll say something else actually here from a really incredible person at Sequoia, um, you know, Sequoia VC Venture Capital uh, firm, you know, one of the most recognizable or the most recognizable um, VC firm. So what he said is, look, apart from look at the destination, what he said is something I really, really kind of um, appreciate is it, don't focus on micro decisions during the day or during the week or during the month but focus on the big picture decisions. Is this the big picture decision? Going to medical school, getting a PhD, working at Boston Consulting Group, McKinsey. Is this gonna bring me opportunities that I'm gonna be able to leverage to, to end up at the goal that I wanna end up at? Which really aligns well with the you know, Sequoia investment philosophy. Very long-term, don't, don't care about the day-to-day -day action. I really care about the next 50 years, right? When they invested, I think it was Airbnb or or some, you know, when Brian Chesky, I think, incredible. I respect you know, Brian's an incredible person who's the CEO of, of uh, Airbnb. When he started a company from from nothing, from literally a, in a, an airbed in San Francisco, and his mentality, which I think is amazing, listen to a lot of his podcasts, and ended up creating a complete disruptor in the, in the hospitality industry where people would tell him he's crazy at, at you know, it, we're, are actually people going to pay to sleep in somebody else's bed? Like, that sounds crazy. 
right? And then he started you know, selling, and I'm going to stop here because I'm probably having it too long of a monologue, but he started selling cereals, if, if you don't know the story. So to fund the company, uh, and, and I think it was Barack Obama's campaign in 2008 or seven, I forgot the year, he created cereal that he called Obama O's, like cereal, right? That he started selling for a ridiculously high price to fund the company, which is nowadays Airbnb, right? So, so that's that level of um, imagination and devotion to, to Airbnb is what led him, you know, led him to, to have a $100 billion company now or more or less. So that's incredible. Yeah, for sure. And like, I think um, our experience overlaps a bit. Uh, I mean, not in the literal sense, because obviously mm -hmm. you have different experiences, but with this kind of thing of reaching out to people, uh, I never put a limit on, my, on myself, like uh, yeah. since the start. And actually I asked this question because a lot of people ask me, uh, okay, how yeah. do you like uh, reach out to these people and so on uh, and so on. And I just say like, I just text them. <laughs> and, exactly. uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, the thing is like, it's obvious that some people won't reply. They are either too busy, they don't see it, or they don't care. And mm -hmm. that's just perfectly fine. But uh, yeah. mostly we are all the same. And like uh, all these people that we put a lot of labels uh, and so on, they are just normal people like us. So exactly. like uh, it's crazy what you can do these days with like uh, platforms like LinkedIn, Twitter, and all that. It's like crazy. So uh, it's its really a blessing to be in this point in time in history and so on. Um, but uh, like all this conversation uh, made me very curious about like interactions with, obviously you met a lot of interesting people. So I'm curious to know like uh, your, some stories you interesting stories you had like with interesting people like you mentioned like Nobel laureates and so on but is there any like mentor or something uh, anything specific insight that you could share with us uh, or just funny story you know, yeah like i mean there there are plenty of <laughs> plenty of stories that i can share and some i cannot share which are i guess very uh, interesting i'll share I, I won't disclose the location or anything but i'll just tell you a, a fascinating kind of small little story. Um, so how, how people, how some people live their lives is uh, incredible to me. Um, so, so I, I had the fortune or opportunity to visit uh, one person uh, in a city, doesn't matter exactly where, uh, in, in a very, very, very uh, luxurious villa. And I got invited there through another person completely coincidentally because I was at, drinking coffee with that person. And he was like, oh, you should meet my friend, X, Y, Z person who's doing this and that. And then that person just came, you know, drink coffee with us. And I was like, what? And then he was like, Let, let's go to let's go to this villa. I was like, uh, OK, let's go to this. Villa. <laughs> um, and we went to that villa. And uh, what I can tell you is um, it, it's almost almost like a movie scene that that villa in, in terms of the number of um incredible paintings inside like in the elevator you see like salvador dali and stuff i'm like what i don't even I, I i don't have an elevator in my villa let alone salvador dali you know in my in my elevator and and then you see this really movie like uh room in that villa which is behind a secret door and to access it you have to push um, um, like a, like a, uh, uh, the head of a sculpture, right? You push the head and then the, the door, which is non -vis not visible at all, opens from a wall and then you enter this room, which, you know, I, I can't really share what's inside, but it's, 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 an, it's like living that sort of lifestyle and seeing that where you believe it only happens in movies is incredible. And how you meet those people is even more incredible, completely coincidentally, right? And, and, but, but maybe, maybe to, to, to answer um, the question a different way, apart from really sharing uh, I mean, incredible stories, you know, from funny to sad to unbelievable, I'll say that in terms of mentors, um, it's, it's, I feel like every person, you, you can learn from every person either what to do or what not to do. So you can gain experience from anyone. I really, I really believe that from, from a person who's 15 and who's 75 and everything in between, who's a Nobel laureate or working a completely different job, you know, I think you can learn from everyone what to do and what not to do. And in terms of mentors, 
it's probably going to sound cliche what I'm going to say, but maybe not. I would say that, you know, if, if it wasn't for, for, the, for the support uh, and for the, you know, um, uh, yeah, I mean, full support from, from my family, you know, mother, father, you know, in Croatia who really supported me whatever I wanted to do. And they, they, they also never imagined that this could happen. I wouldn't be here, you know, and it's super important. I, I feel like many people may be focused on life after you're 15 or 16 or 17, but that critical period in life really shapes you a lot. And if you, if you, if you're influenced, you know, by not so great people, that's not really so good. Right. But if you're influenced by, you know, amazing friends, supportive friends, and everybody has negative, you know, childhood experiences, but, but if you have f fundamental, um, fundamental quality people around you um, um, and, and they help you during that critical phase, which my mother and father helped me. And, and, and just to mention, they're not unbelievable like scientists or doctors or Nobel laureates. They, they're completely regular people, completely normal people, average people in split Croatia. So you don't have to have a father who's the CEO of Microsoft is what I'm saying, who can influence you a lot or, or mother who's the CEO of whatever or a Nobel laureate. So they were um, my, my true like developmental mentors um, in that sense. And then after, after that, I maybe took a slightly different, after like I was 15, 16, I, I took a different path compared to what they took. A path and then people on that path kind of shaped me. I, I, I don't think I can highlight one or two people that shaped me, you know, as a, apart from, you know, family, that shaped me as a person, but rather learning from e each person I thought was, an incredible person, um, I mean, really from everyone, but especially from, from who I think were really quality people, learning from them, gathering, you know, 5% value here, 7% there, 10% there, it shapes you to who you are today. And, and it shapes your fundamental beliefs, I believe, um, as well. So yeah, th th those were my uh, primary mentors, my mother, father, and, you know, incredible, su incredibly supportive group of, uh, of friends. So you, know, you never forget those, you, you must never forget those people, and especially you value that when you're far away from them. So I can't really go to you know, my friends and family, you know, five minute drive from here because they're on the other side of the planet, right? So you, you, you start valuing that fortunately or unfortunately when you're far away from them. And I understand many young people are like, I don't want to live with my mother if I want to go away. Everybody has that. But when you go away after a year, you start missing them, right? And, and that's something that you start valuing maybe later in life. Yeah, that's that's so cool. Like I also, my parents are my best friends. And uh, like, yep. uh, yeah, they they are really like my mentors. Not like, I think you have mentors in specific areas of your life, mm -hmm. and so yeah. But in in for the most of my life, they are big mentors, and I'm deeply grateful. And I I, I really resonate with your story. Yep. Um, like my the following question I have uh is like. You come from this little uh, little town. Uh, mm -hmm. You have friends back there, family, and so on. Maybe uh, they they heard about Harvard and this yep. stuff only in, in movies and so on. Like when you uh, reach, uh, let's say, I don't want to call it success because it's highly subjective and so on. But uh, sure. let, you you achieve something that it's not that usual. Let's say, like how do you manage expectations for yourself and uh, like for the people around around you because uh, yeah. at this point like i, I guess like uh, people consider you like someone smart someone proactive and so on and like they expect stuff for, from you so like what's your system for dealing with expectations yeah that's a very interesting a very very important question um so if you if you look at maybe friends and family when i became a doctor that was their point you know their kind of success metric he's a doctor you know i'm not I can go away now, you know, I can, you know, figuratively die now, as, as they say, right? I'm, I'm finished, you know, I, but for me, and I remember this when I was defending my thesis at the medical school. So usually when you, when you're right about finishing medicine, you need to defend your thesis, like some sort of research that you do, and then you're finished, right? I remember that before and after that thesis. So if the thesis was at 5 p.m., up to 5 p.m., I was working on a completely different project. <laughs> And then I went at five, you know, finished that thesis. And then at 5.30, I was dealing with a completely different project. Because for me, as you mentioned, I fully agree that success is so subjective. And I want to value success when I'm much, much, much later in life. And I don't want to be satisfied with, great, you're at Harvard. Amazing. Look, amazing would never really dream of that. But I want to make, subjectively, I want to make 
a long lasting change in, in my community, in society, in my country or wherever. Ideally Croatia because of the patriotic you know, part of me, but really it could be America um, as well. And I wanna, when I say I'll leave a long lasting, um, uh, um, long lasting impact, I don't primarily mean scientifically. I also mean that people who are non-scientists can feel the impact. And when I say feel the impact, I always give this very blunt, almost stupid kind of um, um, example. I want my grandmother to have a 5% better life, economically, uh, societally, and whatever, and then I'm happy. Because I have this inner, I don't know, inner driver, whatever, that um, I want to help others. Maybe that's why I went into medicine, right? But not only medically or scientific. That's amazing. But I want to have that bigger on a larger scale maybe impact and 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 managing expectations on is, is it could be quite tough you know because if you have very big goals and you fail which is completely fine and so many people fail by the way and and you need to get up that, I, I, I would measure even success by the number of times you got up and not the number of times you succeeded but the number of times you go up after failure um it's 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 quite difficult but um i i think you have to have almost a level of stubbornness uh, inside you that despite all the negative sides, all the failures that are going to happen, you have to keep on moving forward. Have to is a relative word. Have, you don't have to. You can just stop, be a you know, professor at Harvard. Look, that's, for, I just say for most people, that's a pretty fantastic career. But for me, it's great, but I want more, much more than that. I, I want, I, I don't think May, look, maybe 30 years from now, I'll, I'll be able to say, look, I'm done. I, you know, my, my, my job on earth is done. But I feel like it's far, far, far from done. And this opportunity that I have is an amazing way to actually be able to make an impact here scientifically, but also in other ways. And, and you, you know, when, you, when, you, when you ask my father, mother, and friends, many ideas that I kind of propose seem crazy. Uh, you know, from when we started the conferences, I, I told the people at my med school, look, we're going to bring Nobel laureates to our medical school. And they were like, you're crazy, you're a student, that's never going to happen, right? And I did not understand at all what they mean by that, that's not going to happen, I'm a student. I don't care if I'm a student or not a student, we're going to do this, right? And fortunately enough, we actually did it. And I had that kind of impossible is nothing mentality, or, or I had this lecture to, to Harvard students that, um, so Harvard has this conference where people from Asia come to Harvard who are very prospective students, and they invite, you know, speakers to talk about kind of motivational stuff on uh, their careers. And, and I ended the talk, and I'm going to steal this from a company, ended the talk with three, le three words, and that was just do it, right? It's from Nike, right? But just do it, regardless of any, any, um, uh, failures in life, you have to get up, you have to continue, you have to grind, you have to be the proactive person. And, and I have, as I mentioned, I'm going to finish with this, have that really very long-term view in the sense when I'm 60, I want to look back, you know, you never know, and, and this might sound almost morbid in the sense what I'm going to say, but you never know when your, your life is going to finish. You can't finish today, tomorrow, and 50, I don't know. Right? You never know because you can't predict the future. As an investor, you can't predict the future. I love people who predict the future. I know this is going to go up or down. Good for you. So um, you can't really predict the future. And I, 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 yeah, basically, when you look in retrospect, when you're 60, I want to see the impact of my work on a large number of people that improve their life. I, I don't want to, even if I was, a, look, a billionaire, I wouldn't give everyone $100. I would invest $100 in better education so their kids in 100 years can actually have an incredible education rather than give you $100 which you're going to spend on food, which goes in the toilet in the end, if you see what I'm saying. So I wouldn't do that. So that's kind of uh, my, my philosophy here. Yeah, that's, that's great. And like, uh, I try since like, I'm still in the developing phase of my life and yeah. learning and like, uh, yeah, basically all I do is learn. Um, yeah. I'm also trying to study these people that maybe achieved uh, good levels of what people would define as success and then yeah. lost everything either because they committed mistakes or okay. because of chance and so on. Uh, and one common mistake I see among people that um, f that have, let's say, uh, done some interesting things and so on or m made some money, especially mm -hmm. those ones that made money quickly and so on, but uh, it's is, the, is that they sometimes become overconfident and maybe... That's true. 
uh, become overconfident and maybe like uh, they have some lack of humil humility, yeah. you know, and this can happen to everyone. You don't need to have achieved a lot to be mm -hmm. like uh, overconfident. Uh, but my, my following, my follow up question to you would be like, how do you keep your humility in check so that yeah. you like are intellectually humble? Uh, I mean, like yeah. being a scientist, you, you have to be open to changing your your uh, theory of things uh, as facts uh, come and so on uh, and update your your world view uh, with the feedback you receive uh, so like how do you keep humility in general and like intellectual humility along your path yeah that, that's that's an excellent point i say probably other people <laughs> keep me keep my humility uh, you know that i'm i'm firmly on the ground in the sense that you can become really overconfident especially um, as you progress in life and, you know, gain certain uh, titles and so on and so forth. And it, it, it's incredibly important, as, as you mentioned, to kind of stay with your feet firmly, firmly on the ground. I say that um, it's, it's one of the things that I found really uh, excellent in this regard is when, when you have, um, and, and, and really take this in a positive note, when, when, when you have a circle of friends who are not necessarily the CEOs of companies, but are have potentially from very simple jobs, cleaners, incredibly important, right? To, but but from cleaners to CEOs, and you have a wide kind of um, 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 range of of jobs, friends who have various jobs, and you talk to them, you see what their kind of views of the world, views of life are, their problems that they face, which you know for some people might be super high or super stupid or whatever. But when you hear different different views of, of the same world that, that we live in, I feel like for, for many people, uh, um, at least for me, you get a sense that you get a sense of, of what's, at, what's actually, relatively speaking, relevant, what's not relevant, and how, how you can keep your humility uh, um, um, and stay firmly on the ground. That's what, what I believe. And when you have really honest friends who are going to tell you, look, you're way too overconfident, Alan, that is just, you know, pretty stupid what you're saying and just, you know, be less egoistic, right? Many people, I feel like when you're at a certain position, other people tend to just be, be you know, the, the yes person, yes boss, yes boss, yes boss. And then you become like, oh, I'm God here. You know, my decisions are the best. But, but and unfortunately, I feel like I experienced that happening, especially when working with new people who I don't know for a long time. And I, I understand what the, I'm saying is completely stupid, but they're like, because of fear or whatever, they're like, or respect, yes, yes, yes. So when you have a group of people who are going to honestly tell you, look, that's stupid, that's completely irrelevant. You're complete. You're way off, right? I think, and it's not really easy to deal with that. I, I you know, I had experience with people who were overly confident, almost arrogant, I would say. And then you tell them the truth; they're, they they cannot deal with it, right? They, and and you have to also understand their viewpoint because when you hear yes, yes, yes for ten years in a row, and somebody tells you tells you no, it can disrupt your world, right? So so just having these people um, in life that are going to tell you the truth, the hard truth, uh, but obviously in, in a rational way and not, not, not criticize for criticizing sake, but just criticize if it's needed to keep you firm on the ground is super important. And just the value uh, that, that these people, regardless of their function or job, that these people have in your life can be immense, at least in my life, you know, having this group where I work with for like five, six years on these conferences and really many other things. And, and listening to their opinion, which are and, and people who are honestly going to tell me that's good, that's bad, you're overconfident or whatever is super important. Otherwise, I really, I feel like I would have strayed off, you know, in, in, in the dark forest as Dante, you know, Dante would, would, would say. So I think, you know, having this core group of people is incredible value um, in somebody's life. And I don't think, I don't think a lot of people have that, to be honest. So. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I would like the key insight from what you said is like, uh, allow people to be honest with you and like that's Absolutely. that's great yeah that's that's but, awesome and i will say what you said um the the word allow is much easier said than done <laughs> yeah yeah exactly exactly that's true like but that's like uh, with like everything in life it's simple but not easy like common sense yep. is like the 
it's common sense, but at the end yeah. of the day, uh, we don't apply it enough. And yeah, it's, yeah. we just have to continuously keep ourselves in check, have a, a, a group of people that can provide you feedback, either good or bad. And yeah, I think uh, you're, we are roughly right, at, at least in like, yeah, in that yeah. sense. Um, so like, uh, I would love to talk uh, with you for hours, but since we are like uh, time constrained and so on, I, I will jump like into uh, a more specific question, which is sure. about sleep. And when I said sure. to my parents, oh, I'm going to talk with this guy and so on, they were like so curious and they wanted to to know like, uh, what do you think are the, the big misconceptions that people have about sleep, uh, let's say in a broader sense? Yeah, probably the first one that I talk to people is uh, people don't fully understand that after 10 years, after 20 years of poor sleep, it can actually really harm you physically, not just mentally being tired, you know, less energy, all that stuff. So that, that's probably the, the first one I get. And many people are actually surprised, even though they generally speaking, understand that sleep is important, but I don't think they don't fully understand how important for your health is, for your liver health, for your, you know, gut health, for your heart health, for your blood vessel health, right? They don't connect sleep immediately to these, to these aspects. And then kind of under, helping, helping people understand, you know, based on many, many studies, you know, decades of work, that, that, that poor sleep in the long term can impact neurological health, psychiatric health, as I mentioned, increase the risk of diabetes, hypertension, colorectal cancer, right? So from cancer to mental disorder, sleep plays a super important role 10, 20 years um, uh, if you sleep poorly uh, or well 10, 20 um, years. Nothing's gonna, nothing is bad going to happen apart from feeling tired, less concentrated if you sleep poorly for a day or two days. I don't care about that that much apart from, and I will mention this and this is super important, if you're a driver of a bus, or a truck, or some dangerous goods, if you're a pilot, right? It's not really, even though I understand, like, the, maybe the majority of the, you know, flights are automated these days, but still, you wouldn't want to be sleep deprived if you're driving kids to school, is what I'm saying. That is a significant risk, and I think in, 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 a, in, a, in a few countries, I believe in Europe, um, if you have one disorder that's called sleep apnea, which is basically when people stop breathing, literally stop breathing during the night for many, many times. When I say many times, not seven, but it can be a hundred times during the night, they stop breathing. And then you feel super tired during the day. They actually test you for that. And if you have sleep apnea, you cannot drive dangerous goods, which is excellent because you can't drive dangerous goods, kids or anyone, you know, a bus full of 50 people, if you're going to fall asleep behind the wheel and kill everyone, right? So that's super important to notice, you know, in the, in the short term. But in the really long term is, is the aspect on the broad sense uh, how sleep is important for all aspects of, of health. And, and generally speaking, a few kind of tips that I always, you know, can, can I give people and people love tips, I guess, or top picks um, um, is, you know, sleeping for adults, you know, between the ages of 18 and 65, sleeping between seven to nine hours is very important, but sleep is much more than just the duration of sleep. It's about sleep quality, which is, of course, duration is a part of sleep quality, but other aspects such as all the stages of sleep that we go through, stage one, stage two, deep sleep, REM sleep, maybe people have heard of this, it's super important how, you, how those um, uh, sleep stages change between one, other, one another. So usually when people go to sleep, they go to stage one, and then two, and then three, and then REM. And then this lasts for like 100 minutes, so one and a half hours, more or less, and then it changes again. So if these changes don't occur in the way that it should, that they should, or, and, or, if you have less, for example, deep sleep than you should, you can have significantly poor sleep quality, significantly poor sleep quality, which can impact your daily life every day. Not just lack of concentration, all that stuff. It can impact productivity. And lack of sleep has been shown to have a massive impact on the U.S. and probably other economies. So in the U.S., it's estimated that sleep problems, because of lack of productivity, bad decision-making, bad leadership, because of poor sleep, obviously, and fatigue and all that, can cause an impact of around 400 billion U.S. dollars. It's a massive number, right? Many economies around the world don't even have GDP of 400, million, you know, 400 billion um, dollars. So sleep can have a massive impact. And it's super important to follow your sleep health and treat it when when it goes when it goes poor. And the top kind of tips, I guess, what I would say is first um, 
obviously sleep seven to nine hours. Secondly, sleep, try going to sleep and waking up at the exact same time during the day and during the night. So go to sleep at 11 or 12 and, and wake up at seven, regardless of what day it is. So that's the consistency. Super important. Next, turn off all the lights in your room. I have people who say I cannot sleep without in dark, in the dark. That's not good. You should be able to sleep in the dark. If you cannot, we need to work around that because light can impact sleep severely, especially the secretion of one hormone. As I mentioned, this hormone is called melatonin. Probably people have heard of it. Some people take it by mouth, right? Supplements, but it's super important for sleep. And if you have light on, it suppresses melatonin and your sleep is going to get, get, get pretty much bad. Um, so turn off the light. Uh, room temperature below 21 degrees Celsius. I don't know in Fahrenheit. You know, I live in America for four years. I, I, know, I have no idea what Fahrenheit even is, let alone what 21 degrees in, in Fahrenheit is. Let's say, I don't know, 60. <laughs> Maybe it isn't. Um, so, so that. And next, try to have a stress relief routine before sleep. So when you go to bed, don't look at your phone because of one, the blue light that's coming from your phone that's going to suppress melatonin. Even if you put the blue light filter on, it's going to suppress melatonin up to a degree. Not as much, but up to a degree. Up to a degree. Don't use your phone tablet and don't scroll through your emails five minutes before you go to sleep and don't watch a horror movie five minutes before you go to sleep. That's not smart. So those are a few very thin. And don't, of course, don't eat a big meal and don't drink alcohol or a massive amount of water before you go to sleep because you're going to go wake up in the middle of night and need to go to the toilet. So those are a few kind of things that are, are simple, but if you ask people, very few people follow all of these, all of these tips. That's right. Uh, would you also not recommend watching the news before sleep? Yeah. <laughs> well, depending on what news. So, <laughs> you know, um, um, so, so what I would recommend, you, you can watch the news at eight if you go to sleep at, you know, 11, but really don't watch the news, especially these days, you know, terrible stuff happening around the world because some people are more prone to, kind of uh, emotional reaction to all of this stuff. And some people are not as prone. So just have a stress relief, you know, kind of session 15 minutes before sleep, go take a nice little warm shower, relax, relax. And if you think, oh no, I have to work at, you know, midnight, I understand, if you're, especially if you have a startup, I completely understand that. But on the other hand, if you don't sleep, your productivity is going to go down. So you're not really efficient in the, in the, for, for the next day, even though you have like 10 hours of waking time or whatever, let's say 15 hours of waking time, it's in effect going to be much reduced because you're not concentrated, you're not productive because you slept poorly last night. So by sleeping seven to nine hours, you're actually investing in the next day and not, not, uh, uh, and being super efficient in using that time um, uh, for sleeping. So. Yeah, I, I asked this because it was a selfish, a selfish question because my yeah. dad is going to watch it. Um, yeah. So it's it's a, a direct tip to him. Um, yeah. But anyways, um, I, I would like, okay, so the, the audience might uh, have heard us talk about all these different stuff, uh, Harvard, mm -hmm. sleep and so on. But the, the real reason why you're here is because we are both super passionate about this thing sure. called investing. Uh, and so, like, how does uh, a scientist uh, yeah. uh, working at Harvard, teaching and so on, fall uh, in love with this thing called investing? And uh, how, what ignited your passion? Let's say? Sure. And it might seem really contradictory or e almost unbelievable that, that, you know, somebody of my background would, you know, be able to invest. Um, but um, it all happened very accidentally, I, I, I think. I, I don't. I remember the exact moment, but I'll just give you kind of a broad overview. During COVID, when everybody was locked down, right, um, you didn't have much to do in the sense that you can't really go to work physically. You need to stay home, work remotely, all of that stuff. And some people started taking up music classes, you know, dance classes, learning a new language, you know, through Duolingo or whatever. Um, and for whatever reason, I don't know where I saw it. I saw like some people started investing money in something called stocks. What in the world are stocks, right? What's an ETF? <laughs> you know, I, I knew, you know, I knew of, of course, Apple, Microsoft, but they had stocks. How does that work? I, I knew nothing. And then just because I knew nothing or extremely little about this stuff, I started getting interested. 
And then when you start getting interested, I started reading, you know, on, on the typical news portals, Bloomberg or CNBC, all that stuff. I started reading about this stuff. And it started intriguing me, these articles, you know, not some, some numbers, operating profit, net profit, this and that. I was like, this kind of starts getting interesting to me. And then I started digging deeper and deeper. I started reading actually a few books. Um, or listening to audio books. So I don't know if that's considered reading, probably not, I don't know, but audio, whatever, reading or listening to books. And one of the books was from Peter Lynch. He's you know amazing person for, for obvious reasons. I'm probably familiar with all the people listening um, to this. And the book is called, the audio book or whatever, One Up on Wall Street. It, people, people probably heard of that book. And I was like, this guy is amazing. This makes complete sense. I don't know what, why anybody would not listen to this. Right, and that like, really ignited some spark that I didn't know I even had, and I started some. I started investing, and the first thing I did, at, because I, probably everybody does that, I was like, "Let's invest in the S and P 500. What is the Standard and Poor's 500? Oh, I guess 500 stands for like 500 companies, right? And I started investing in that, and and. You know, because of the COVID, everything went up and all the, you know, fiscal stimulus and so on and so forth. And I thought to myself, which was a great lesson, uh, and I'm going to explain, this is super easy until everything went down. And that was an amazing lesson, you know, from in 2022 or whenever, in 20, yeah, 2022, everything went down. I was like, this is really not easy at all. Like, what am I doing here? You know, all the typical, I think, stuff that everybody faces when they start investing, everything's easy until it isn't. You know, everybody's a long-term investor until they feel short-term pain. So I love that one. I don't know who said it, but somebody um, somebody said it. And I felt the short-term pain. It was terrible. I was like, I'm never going to be able to do this. But I was so stubborn, um, and I wanted to do this. I almost felt at that point it was like a competition of sorts, right? You have to beat the S&P like, and all that, all that stuff. But then after, after two or three years now, right, I started really understanding it, or what I would perceive that investing truly is. And that is not looking at your phone 20 times a day, oh, this goes up a dollar, down a dollar, all that stuff, right? People do that for a living and some are successful, most aren't, but some are, good for them. Uh, I'm not one of them. And I don't, I don't perceive investing as a gambling, you know, table or, or Las Vegas, although some people do, and I understand that there are some, some certain aspects that you can kind of maybe argue that it is for, for a certain part. But for me, it's really finding uh, what I understood later on, and we can talk about the journey and everything to this understanding and uh, it, in losing money, you know, getting money and losing money. I think losing money is super important. Even though it sounds stupid, but I think it's super important to, to learn the lessons. And I feel like you learn it much better when you lose the money rather than you, when you actually make the money. But nowadays, really uh, investing, finding amazing companies, we can talk about it, it can be a, you know, a, a 50 or 100 or $200 billion company or, or $2 trillion company or a micro cap, like $50 million US, right? Dollar, but in, finding amazing companies with great leadership skills. I want to give you part of my salary, part of my money, and I want to enjoy the ride with you as you grow. So that's, that's how I view it. And, and, I, I, and, and probably the most important part for, for me is I truly love it. I, it it's hard, hard to put the finger on, my finger on what I truly love. But I guess the research around the companies and understanding what, understanding the business models and applying it to the stuff that I do. I learned so much from companies when I organized my conferences, which, which sounds completely stupid. But you learn so much. You learn how it's important. For example, I can you know, mention a few of these. Uh, one of the companies, I think even you, know, I, you and I talked, to it, talked about this, is Hermes, right? Hermes. A company that, I mean, we can talk about, obviously, much more important to talk about the losers, but also, um, tell, or mistakes that I made. Um, but Hermes, what I learned from them is, I would, if you asked me three years ago, who in the world is purchasing $20,000 handbags, I would say crazy people. But then you learn, the model they build, the, the artisanal quality that these you know, handbags and clothes and whatever have, and the brand quality and the story, the history that you cannot create, even if you have $100 billion, you cannot create the history of Hermes and packaging that in the client relationship, which is incredible, and selling the story. It's not, it, for me, it's not about the handbag, the leather, whatever. It's about the story that you get, which is it, you, you can't pay for the brand, is what I learned. 
and the limited limitedness of these products. You cannot go and buy a handbag, you know, even if you have the money, you can't go and buy it, right? You have to wait in line for it, which is crazy. And then I understood, okay, let's create a product at our conferences, a, a certain workshop or something with a Nobel laureate. Let's almost artificially, but I'm not saying this in a negative way, artificially create the limitedness of the workshop and people read, you know, you have 10, 10 places that, you know, the application is open at 5 p.m. The first 10 people are going to get this exclusive opportunity talking three hours with a Nobel laureate over coffee or whatever, for example. And it really does work. But because you're, you're, you have the story you create, it's not about, of course, it's super important the time with the Nobel laureate or the handbag, maybe the quality is amazing, right? But the story is incredibly important. And, and what Brian Chesky, I mentioned is, he has an incredible story. And the story he told, I'm not, I don't even want to say sold through Airbnb, but the story he told through Airbnb. So Airbnb, to a sense, um, when I talk to young people, who, younger people who use it, it's not about the bed I'm going to sleep in. It's about the people I'm going to meet when sleeping with, in a bed, in, in a room with somebody else. You know, I'm, I'm going to you know, sleep with a family. So these people actually enjoy the interactions with the families and enjoy making new friends through Airbnb. And by the way, they have a room. So it's, those types of stories are incredible to me. And I thoroughly enjoy, you know, even talking, as you can probably see <laughs> about them. Yeah, for sure. Uh, do you think I can ask one more question before I let you go? You can ask a few more questions. Feel free. There, there's. Uh, I, I know, I, and I respect that you respect that I have a meeting afterwards. Afterwards, but feel free to ask a few more questions. Yeah, for sure. Okay, sure. Uh, that's cool. Uh, so I wanted to ask you, like, you you touched upon some psychology elements, like yeah. uh, scarcity that you can learn in books like Influence from Robert Cialdini. By the way, amazing book uh but i would like to know what did you learn from your sleep research or mm -hmm. scientist let's say uh yep. brain uh to, that you could use in investing and yep. maybe uh after sharing with us a few insights you could also talk about sure. like some of the companies that you really sure. loved in the medical space like in mode sure. uh, resmed sure. and so on yeah sure absolutely so that's, that's a great point I certainly didn't learn what operating profit or return invested capital is while doing sleep research. That is certainly not it. Or what, what's great management, but what I, or what's a moat or whatever. But what I did learn is science, especially at places like Harvard, these are the amazing institutions, they, they teach you or you learn how, how, how quality research looks like in general. You have to dig so deep. It's not just, for example, in sleep. It's, we don't do primarily here research. Does poor sleep impact sugar levels in the blood? That's way too superficial. For it, it, I'm going to explain for us. What we would do is, does poor sleep impact this specific receptor, which then impacts a, another pathway, which leads to high glucose or high, high, you know, high sugar or low sugar? And you have to dig so deep into the molecular aspect of that receptor, the structure of the receptor, the, the, even though you know nothing about that receptor. So you have to educate yourself and read so many papers and understand that many papers in science are not replicable at all, even though they're published. And many people have this misconception that if a scientific paper is published, it must be a dogma, it must be true. Unfortunately, it's not. Many people are, many, many, these, many of these papers are not really reliable. And you have to really understand um, um, how to look through these papers. You have to understand what deep, deep, deep research looks like and spending hours, days, and weeks on one tiny thing. What, that is what I spent on learning what is, for example, return on invested capital. I understand it sounds very simple. Well, it's the return they make on the capital they invest. But what, what does it truly mean? How do they invest the money? Where do they invest the money? Not just the percentage. Oh, better than 20 is good or whatever. But what influences all that stuff? Let me look at examples of companies. Does this really correlate with the, with the performance of the company, of the stock, of the, of the uh, growth of the company? All of that stuff takes incredible amounts of research. So I really, all the companies I do research on, I never look at the balance sheet in 10 minutes. Oh, good, bad, operating profit is that I'm going to invest. It's an incredible, in my opinion, at least for me, it's an incredible amount of work that I carried on from the sleep research, even though it's 
different, but the same in the way that you have to be able to tell yourself, do I truly understand what this company does, how it invests money, the, all that sort of stuff, but that's carried over from the depth or quality of research that we do for sleep is carried into investing. So that would be my primary lesson that I would probably say here. And, and you mentioned a few companies in the, in the, in the kind of healthcare, let's put a healthcare space or veterinary space or animal health, you know, you mentioned um, um, Zoetis, I, I mean, Zoetis and InMode, IDEX is another company. And um, um, so, so what, what I love about these companies, and by the way, I do use products from Zoetis. I do use services from IDEX, which are both companies that, that do, uh, that, that offer services in the veterinary space and even IDEX offers uh, for some uh, human um, um, research as well. Anyways, you, you also, uh, in our last chat, you talked about ResMed, right? So I did. Uh, I did. I talked about, you know, ResMed is, is a product uh, that I use, not personally, but as a physician in Croatia, I'm very familiar with. ResMed builds primarily devices to treat sleep apnea. So those devices are called, I mean, they have different kind of uh, variations, but th those devices are called CPAPs. CPAP, which stands for Continuously Positive Airway Pressure, and I fully understand how those devices work and the, the whole interface with the patient. And they're almost a duopoly in the sense that Philips, who unfortunately had many issues with their, which Philips, which is a Dutch company, which had many issues with their, with their sleep apnea devices, and RedMed are basically two, two duopolies in that regard. And because of that understanding, I felt comfortable. I understand the business. I understand what they do. Let's look at the numbers. The numbers should tell me the truth. And when I look at the numbers, and we, you know, we can talk or we don't have to talk about the numbers, I said to myself, this looks like a really uh, great investment in the sense that I believe that the, 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 the field of sleep apnea or the diagnosis of sleep apnea. There are so many, there are a third, almost a third of adults are estimated, males especially, to suffer from sleep apnea. And so many are undiagnosed. And I believe it's an incredibly important space and incredibly untapped space. And the, in my opinion, the growth opportunities are incredible based on the you know, clinical work I did. The numbers work, the story work, I understand what they do. The, the, you know, the CEO, I think is a you know, great manager, and I had, I had no prob problem investing my own, you know, obviously personal money in it. The stock can go down, up, as long as the management does what it says, as long as the numbers tell me what I want them to tell, it can go up or down, I don't care. Let's look at it in five years and see what, what, what the company does, so. Yeah, that's, that's so cool. And I find that uh, basically you are the living proof of the, Peter Lynch philosophy, uh, invest in, in, in what you know and uh, where you have an, an edge because you obviously have Absolutely. an edge in, in sleep research. So uh, it, it struck me as very interesting that you, yeah, you invested in ResMed yeah. and maybe uh, someday you can come on the channel and discuss the company and so on. That would be awesome. Um, yeah, but to wrap it up, uh, I really want to ask you this final question, which mm -hmm. is kind of philosophical, but anyways, let's, let's yeah. go. Uh, I so <laughs> I, I would like to know what are you running towards and what yeah. are you running from? Yeah. You know, uh, what, what I'll tell you is for people who are listening before I answer the question, this was one of the more enjoyable interviews I did. I'll just say that before, you know, before, before I answer the questions and really the, the, the depth of the questions you ask is admirable, especially for some for somebody at your age. So I'll say that before you know before we. So congratulations on that. I you know I did quite a few of interviews and lectures and so on, but one of the more enjoyable ones really. So oh, to, okay. answer, to to answer the uh, the question that I already forgot. Um, oh yeah, what are you running away from and and running towards? So <laughs> it's it's very philosophical, um, and let me think. Let me think about it for like a, a second or two. Um, yeah, especially, you have your... the, especially the running away from. It's it's really an amazing question. <laughs> um, I, I, the first thing that 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 comes to mind, and it might seem maybe slightly unsatisfactory to answer it this way, I'm running away from failure. <laughs> um, and what is failure? And 
it's incredibly subjective. And for me, failure um, would not be if I if, if the conference is, if the next conference fails. That that's not that's not my definition. My definition of failure, and we talked about this um, earlier, is if at my deathbed, which could be tomorrow in 50 years, or I don't know, if I did not make a change in other people's lives for the better, of course, that would be my, I would be really, that, I would consider that, that, that my life is or was a failure. And you can, you can see here that I'm not talking about Harvard. I'm not talking about any position, titles. That I, you know, I'm running away from being a doctor at, I don't know, some smaller hospital. Maybe some people will say that. I don't, that's, that's completely irrelevant to me. Um, and, and running towards is that um, it's slightly foggy in my, in, my, in, my, um, in, my, in my kind of world, but it is that um, that I'm going to explain being in a position it could be a, a actual physical position like a high hierarchy position but it could be metaphorically a position where with either monetary money or advice or something else that I'm able to make and I, I know I'm able to make um, a change in young people's lives. So people like you, people, you know, 20, 25, whatever, who are super ambitious in whatever. So they can be doctors, podcasters, investors, uh, dancers, I don't care. Whatever they're passionate for. If I can just slightly, I don't look, I don't have to open the door for them. I just need to unlock the lock and let them open the door in a, in a philosophical sense. But I want to be the facilitator and not the blocker. I, I, I know many blockers in the world, unfortunately, um, and it's quite sad. And, and it, it usually goes like this. Well, I had this, this, and this experience. Why should you not have the same? Why should you have an easier experience? It, I, I disagree with that. Um, so I want, I'm running towards being a facilitator, but it is difficult for me to put my finger on what that would exactly be but definitely um it's it's, it's a fascinating question actually we can discuss it even more but um yeah yeah i find those these kind of questions really open and everyone answers uh based on their own life experience yeah. and so on and that's so beautiful uh, to me and that's what i love about these kind of conversations and yeah, I, I really feel like we should talk again, uh, but I don't know, maybe we could discuss it on pri in private uh, afterwards. Absolutely. So yeah, uh, I had a ton and, of fun. Uh, sorry, sorry, go on. I'll just add one more thing. So I, I just read one question that, 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 that you mentioned or sent, and I, I wanted, to, wanted to answer it in very simply. So it's like one sentence. And, and the question was, what's the best moment of your life? I think. It oh, was yeah. Like what was the best day of your life? Exactly. What was the best day of your life? And I'll answer it very simply. It was the, and it may be stupid. It was the day I was born. That was the best day of my <laughs> life that I'm not even aware of. That was the best day of, because without that, I wouldn't be here and all the, all the rest would be kind of history. So that was the best day of my life that I understood after you asked the question, I was like, what, what is the best day of my life? Well, actually, that, the day I don't even remember. Yeah, that's that's awesome. I would agree with you. Like, uh, it it truly is the the starting point of everything. So yeah, it it's the best day for sure. Uh, maybe for parents is the the day they their kids were born and so on. Exactly. But yeah, for us is uh, the day we were born in. Yeah, for yeah. sure. And given uh, this incredible opportunity on this planet, with all the pitfalls that it has, uh, it, it's it's an incredible planet, an incredible opportunity, really. Uh, to be able to make a change and to, you know, just to, to live the life uh, here on Earth, even though it sounds, sounds like Elon Musk, you know, he's going to Mars and whatever, <laughs> but, but it is an incredible, really, privilege to, God knows where, where we're going to go next, but this is a, at least gr a great point in our journey. 
stuff. Exactly, for sure. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I'm here protecting your time more than yourself. <laughs> you. <laughs> I, I know, I know. Other people are waiting for me, but I'm like not stopping. So yeah, you stop it. <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe some t someday if you are uh, become like a super hyper busy person, you can always call me, and I I can like uh, be the one like. Uh, setting the limits for your time and so on. <laughs> <laughs> I'll employ you definitely. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But anyways, I was saying uh, I had a ton of fun really. Um, like for sure, this was one of the most insightful conversation ever. And this one and the one we had uh, previously. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's fascinating to me and I'm really grateful. So thank you for, for sharing with me your time. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, David, uh, for reminding me and, you know, for everyone who's listening or watching or whatever, if, you, if you're interested deeper in sleep or anything that I do that we talked about, always feel free to reach out on you know, social media or wherever really you can, you can find me. Yeah, sure. I'll make sure to include the links in the, uh, in the description and yeah, you, people will reach out to you and yeah, I think uh, people will, will like this conversation. It was really cool. Super. Thank you so much, David.